Welcome to Dead Headspace, a part of Silver Shamrock's Horrorcast, a podcast network that includes Killing Time with Silver Shamrock and Unburying the Dead, where we exhume classic horror paperbacks for the new generation. I'm your host, Patrick R. McDonough, joined always by my co-host, Brennan LaFaro. Say hi, Brennan. Hello, everybody. And today we are focusing on an anthology that releases in eight days from the day that this episode releases, Body Shocks and Extreme Tales of Body Horror. Joining us is the editor, Ellen Datlow. Say hi, Ellen. Hi. <laughs> hi, everybody. <laughs> and we're joined also by four contributors. We'll start with uh, Richard Cadry. Say hi, Richard. Hi, nice to be here. Livia Lou Ellen. Hi, hi, everyone. Hi. <laughs> uh, Karen Warren. Hello, everyone. Hi. <laughs> and Nathan Ballinger. Did I get that? La- did I say your last name right? You did. Oh, okay. Say, say hi, Nathan. <laughs> Hello. Hi. <laughs> so, Brennan, you do the honor, sir. Ask the first question. So, since we have a lot of people on here who are first-time guests, we're not going to do our, you know, big, long uh, intro question, but um, I'd love to go around and have everybody just tell us a little bit about yourself, about your writing career. Um, Ellen, let's start with you. Okay, I'm an editor of short fiction. I don't write at all, if I can help it. When I have to write, I write introductions and I often get people to help me with those. Um, I've worked at Omni for 17 years, mostly editing science fiction, got into horror in the 90, I guess, early 90s and have been editing anthologies. Right now I work freelance. I um, consult for tour.com for stories and novellas and I edit anthologies. And that's me. That's you. <laughs> Livia, let's go to you next. Uh, I write short stories and novellas, uh, horror, and I'm known for my uh, erotic elements in a lot of my my work. And I have two collections out and I'm working on a novella right now, and that's me. Richard, throw it to you, sir. Um, Richard Cadry, I write books, I write stories, I've written comics and some uh, secret movie scripts that haven't, that I can't talk about yet. <laughs> uh, Ellen at Omni, in fact, bought my first US short story. A million Didn't, years wasn't ago. it wasn't it published in Interzone first that one? It was published that... in Interzone, but I'd never published anything in right. America. And you right. you picked that up, so that was that was a, a a real big kick for me to not only have my first story finally in America, but to have it in Omni of all places. I just want to jump in before the other people introduce us. You know, Richard, that I knew you as an artist, right? I didn't know you were a writer when I met oh, you, right. Murphy. Um, I met them in San Francisco, you know, he and Pat Murphy were partners and Richard had had used to do collages and I bought Mm -hmm. it from him, I think. And I had absolutely no idea he was a writer, but it turns out, because we weren't writing. It's like when I would tell people, you go to Clarion and you don't write anything for five years or 10 years, don't worry about it. That's happened to Richard Cadry. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Massive writer blocks. You you just don't do it. And so it wasn't until he's published that story in Interzone that I realized he was a writer, that he was writing. Anyway, mm-hmm. okay. <laughs> uh, Karen, let's throw it to you. I'm a novelist and short story writer and novellas as well, uh, horror and science fiction. I published my first short story in 1993, very mm-hmm. long time ago. Um, seven short story collections, five novels, and um, very early on in my career was loving um, Ellen's anthologies and wanting to be published by her. And I found an old magazine, actually an old horror magazine uh, from 1995, which was an interview with Ellen. And I've circled it. She says she's uh, reading for her revenge anthology. And I've circled that and I've got a little note saying, get a dress. <laughs> <laughs> but you never <laughs> sent me anything, did you? No, I did, I did. And we can talk about that when we, we, when we get to my, okay. the sto- right, talking about right. the stories, we'll talk right. about that. But this is where mm. our, this is where our relationship began, was me circling get a dress. And I did somehow, <laughs> I don't know. It was pre-internet days, but I must have figured it out some way or other. Hopefully I didn't sort of show up on your doorstep and shove it under your 
on the indoor mat or something. Or over the transom. Yeah. <laughs> Would she be the first to uh, shove a story under your door, Ellen? Uh, yes, I've had, I did have someone who actually lived in my neighborhood who tried to hand me a manuscript. And oh my gosh. I was, oh, so wow. shocked, I was so shocked I took it. I think I took it. Wow. I immediately threw it out. Oh my etiquette, God. people, etiquette. Nathan, I promise I'm. Uh, I, I promise we won't always come to you last, but it just oh, seems to be working that way so far. So tell us a little bit about yourself. I'm comfortable back here. Um, I uh, I write horror and dark fantasy. I've got two books out, uh, collections of short stories, uh, and uh, we've got a novel forthcoming. And uh, I've written a an, a feature length audio script, which will be debuting later this month uh a horror story um yeah that's 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 me so ellen i i'm gonna go with you because i i'm gonna take a shot in the dark and say you're the one that came up with this concept is that fair to say or did someone else come up with the concept for this anthology i probably came up with it with my publisher jacob weissman but i don't recall usually I mean, I do reprint anthologies with Jacob at Tachyon, and we, he is interested in big ideas. He doesn't like small themes. And for, his, for those books, we try to come up with big themes. Like I did Lovecraft's Monsters. I did um, The Cutting Room, which was a reprint film anthology, mm -hmm. um, and things like that. And I don't, he might have mentioned body horror because I don't think I would have thought of it because it's not something I think about much because in the past, I've usually thought of it as being splatterpunk, which I'm not really a fan of. Mm -hmm. So I have a feeling he might have mentioned it. And then I was thinking about it. I think I came up with the title. Um, so it was, I guess it was a mutual discussion about, well, what should, we, what should I do next? And yeah, that sounds interesting. And then I thought of, with all the anthologies I do that are reprint anthologies for him, I think of the stories that I know of that I can remember that might work in the anthology first to get like a you know a little central thing going and then i what i do after that is contact lots and lots of my authors and writers who i think might do something along those lines or might have a story that might fit and sometimes you know it's often a shot in the dark like i didn't think nathan would necessarily or actually the only one I thought of, I guess, would, would be Livia automatically. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the rest of you, I, the rest ah. of you, I don't think I would have thought of you as doing body horror. So, but that's what I do. And sometimes people send me three or four stories for me to look at, e email them. And then I'll go through all the stories and figure out what, what works and what doesn't. And, what I, and sometimes actually Stefan Jemenowitz is my secret helper i mean he's also helped sometimes ghost my intros he is great on history of the of the of horror mm -hmm. and he'll give me he'll tell me what public domain stories might work and he actually sent me about three or four public domain stories that he thought might be considered body horror and i think i read i don't know if i read all four of them but i know i read one or two and decided against them i i just didn't think they were what i wanted mm -hmm. Oh, that makes sense. I love the cover. As soon as I saw that, I was blown away. It's it's really neat. I mean, there's yeah. a lot of covers with eyes and skeletons and whatnot. Not that there's a skeleton <laughs> on this, but I mean, this is. So I don't cool. have a copy, but I don't have the arc or anything, so I don't. I can't. We can't show it off. But and, you know, it was not originally red. I forget oh. what it was like blue or green, and um, it was sent to me. <laughs> it was emailed to me, and I said, "That looks like a science fiction cover." Mm. I don't see any. Hard. yeah it looked more cyberpunk in the original did i show you that did i show you that? yeah you did yeah and it's like uh um and i said i think we need blood <laughs> let's make it red we need blood and you know blood <laughs> and once he did that once john colcart did that it it jellied i mean it gelled it was perfect but at green and blue it was like no that's science fiction that's not horror I agree. Uh, just for it potential, looked it looked electrical rather than bloody. Oh, okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I I totally get the whole sci-fi vibe because if it the way it is now with it all being different shades of red, it just it, mm -hmm. it does scream horror. But just for potential um, readers, uh, just a few other authors that are in this is Carmen Marie Machado, Priya Sharma, Sandra Ka, and um, Tanera, uh, 
R.C. Uh, Matheson. That's Richard Matheson's son, isn't it? Yeah. That's one of, pretty, oh, yeah. Another oh. one, Christian Matheson. Oh, okay. Uh, R.C. Yeah. Richard Christian Matheson, but he also has another son, I think, whose name is Christian, who I never met. That gets confusing. <laughs> well, I since I don't know the other one, it doesn't to me. That's yeah. why everyone calls R.C. R.C. Yeah. Gotcha. To Nannery Do and Gemma Files, just name uh, a few of many more. But yeah, it's a great anthology. I, I love what all you guys did. Um, Ellen, did I, before I jump to, I want to go to Karen first, if that's all right with everyone, but did, I don't want to cut you off. Is there anything else of the, I guess, origin story of how this anthology came to be? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, mean, I think of anything we can talk about. It. <laughs> okay. Patrick, I'm going to jump in real quick. I'm going to go the lo-fi version of showing uh, oh, good. audio, oh, cool. audio yeah, or video yeah. people our yeah. uh, cover here that we were just yeah. talking about. <laughs> so Karen, with yours, uh, it was a really, I am going to, if it's not me, or Brent, Brendan will do it, but we're going to ask you guys to describe the synopsis so we don't ruin it. Um, before I do that with you, Karen, and I'm reaching out, I'm asking you first because uh, I just thought it was really interesting what you did with um, family. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, in your own words, can you describe what this story is and tell without us that? Without spoilers. <laughs> yeah, without spoilers. No, no, no spoilers, no spoilers. Well, um, it was inspired by stories of, and true stories, of people who have a second child to act as a donor for a first very sick child. And my response to that, I actually wrote it before I was a parent, but we were always already starting to think about becoming parents, I guess. Um, so it was my, this, is, this story is really my response to <coughs> that and what that means. So very much family involved in what you do for family. So the basic idea is an older couple um, who've never had children, but the man is very sick and has a a rare blood type and so they have a child to provide blood transfusions for the man and this goes on through this through this child's life um until seeing other things happen <laughs> so yeah it's pretty it's pretty nasty um and i tried to it was actually made into a short film um which is really exciting but I think they tried to because they were wanting to make it just pure horror and losing the elements of family and ordinariness of it all. So they, it's set in, basically set in the suburbs, the idea that what it, we don't know what's happening behind closed doors and what one family thinks is ordinary is completely horrifying to other families. And the filmmakers kind of twisted a little bit of that and wanted to make it out in a creepy, creepy place out in the country and weird things happening in the basement and all this sort of stuff. And I had to really fight to try and just keep the ordinary nature of what families are like throughout it yeah because when i read that all i could think about was you know families that live next to you or whatnot but you don't know what they're like behind closed doors necessarily and i think that's perfect suburban area or what have you is that's the best setting that's when you set it in brennan jump in man sure um so first off i i can't think if anybody mentioned it, but we should probably mention the name of the story is A Positive, so that readers looking for that one can uh, can find it. It's relatively early on in the book. Um, Nathan, let's send it to you. Your story, uh, you go where it takes you. Um, one thing I really kind of dug about it is you almost have this um, layered aspect to it, like kind of a story within a story. So I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about yours. Uh, sure. <clears throat> this is uh, this is the first story I ever sold to Ellen uh, way back in 2003. Um, it is a story about uh, uh, a young woman who's a waitress in a little diner on the Louisiana coast. Uh, and she is raising a, uh, a child who uh, who's a difficult child, um, a little girl who's three years old uh, who has some behavioral problems. Um, and she meets somebody who comes to the diner who... Uh, is she discovers is able to change his skins and um uh it uh it kind of it kind of triggers a uh, a life-altering decision uh that she makes later on this was uh actually it was also ended up being the uh first episode in the uh, a series called monsterland um and it was a uh, 
kind of a treat for me to see this one get realized on screen. Uh, Caitlin Deaver played the uh, played the the mom, and uh, as a long time Caitlin Deaver fan, I was I was especially uh, excited to see that happen. That's really neat. Yeah. So when I read that story, I just <laughs> your folk when you focused on certain aspects of change changing skins and if at any point we spoil anything jump in and say nope we'll get that by the way i should say that uh <laughs> when you describe that man that was so creepy I, that's really all i could say about it you <laughs> nailed it so problem <laughs> on that um is there any aspect of this story that you ever thought you could maybe write a longer form for this because it felt like this could be explored a little bit more uh, no, uh, I, I did consider it at one point very early on. Um, I thought, but but uh, but I think not. And I, and the reason is that the re one of the impulses behind writing the story in the first place, besides the fact that I was a brand new parent and uh, I was just, and I had been hearing stories about some parents who, uh, well, I guess I'm about to spoil things, so I'll I'll not say that. <laughs> uh, but um, who couldn't deal uh, with troublesome children? Yeah. Uh, which I didn't have, but um, anyway, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go down that road because I'll have to, I'll have to spoil the story to talk about that, so I just won't. But, but uh, oh, all right, I want to say something after you're done about it, okay? Continue. But I don't, the reason I don't want to go back into that world, uh, and explore any more of that is because part of the point of the story was exploring side characters, what I think of as side characters in typical fantasy stories. Um, the guy who changes his skins to me is is what a typical horror narrative would focus on. He's the guy who's doing interesting things, but I didn't want to focus on him. I want to focus on uh, the character that these, you know, the side character, he kind of like stumbles across, brushes against uh, just for, you know, just for an evening. And uh, now how do these side characters that we never see in stories, how are their lives altered by these, by these encounters with the, uh, with the horrific or the numinous or what have you. And so I think if I went back and wrote more about this, I would sort of betray that core idea. Nathan, how did I, did I approach you about it? Because when I bought that and remembering it, I never would have thought of it as a body horror story. Yeah. I mean, that's not how I perceived it. So did you, did I approach you and say, do you have any body horror? Or did I actually remember that that story was body horror even though I hadn't thought of it that way do you remember I, th I think both I think you asked me uh if I had any and I couldn't really think of anything that really fit that descriptor really and I think that you suggested maybe maybe uh you go where it takes you which when you said when you did I felt that was appropriate because I remember when I wrote that that particular scene I very much had Clive Barker in mind uh and so I was like oh yeah that makes sense I must have reread it looking for some I don't know I mean I don't I don't remember how I actually thought of that because I just don't remember that even though that's a major part of it I don't remember that's not what I think of when I think of that story yeah which, that's but, not the thing means, that I even which means your intent worked oh, well that's good your, what you intend worked <laughs> right. now Livia I'm going to jump to you and tell me if I'm not saying the title right Cineris is that scenario scenarios scenarios okay so that's like it's that's fine a... sometimes i can't pronounce my own titles <laughs> i'm like this is a fancy word and it looks cool and then i have to to say it at a reading and i'm like turning bright red and going, <laughs> I, i'm drunk i don't know what i'm doing because <laughs> i can't I, admit that i can't pronounce it <laughs> i like what you did it's a I mean, isn't it a historical fiction? It's set in... Yeah, it is. It was part of a, a historical uh, anthology um, okay. that I won't, and that I won't mention the title because to do so might give away what the story is about. And I don't want anyone going into it who hasn't read it before to have any preconceived notions about what the main character is going for or what she's encountering. That's fair. Okay. So, uh, so I'll what just... can you tell us about it? Yeah, there you go. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you seem really choked up. Um, so it's about a young woman at the very end of the French Revolution who is has been um, enlisted uh, to help a group of scientists, kind of outliers who are um, have taken over this massive crumbling building and courtyard 
and uh, they're conducting all of these experiments on on on. Uh, I forget the phrase for it, but in the in the 1800s, there was this big craze over finding uh, wild children in Europe, you know, children who had been raised by wolves and bears and who didn't know any language and who were like half wolf, half half child, half human. And um, if they could be rehabilitated into society uh, or if they were if they were completely feral, and, and how did they get that way? And so this whole huge complex is devoted to these feral children, but what she and the other scientists and the other volunteers don't realize until it's too late is that a disease is sweeping throughout the complex, infecting everyone. And, and the body horror uh, is, what's happening to these scientific subjects and what they do, you know, they, because they dissect them and they look inside their brains and everything else, but also what happens as the disease starts to take over everyone. And in particular, the protagonist, because you see it through her eyes, you know, what's happening to her body and what's happening to her mind as, as the disease takes hold. Yeah. <laughs> Like Ellen said earlier, it was, it was, excuse me, it was definitely a story where it's not unexpected for what you write. And I love that about it. Yeah, it, it definitely, definitely hit some, uh, don't eat while you read Livia's stories, basically. <laughs> you know, the, the thing is, is that when I'm writing, I don't, oh, when I'm writing stories like these, I don't really say I'm going to write something really grotesque. I'm, I'm going to write body horror. I just, I just write things that kind of arise out of like emotions or feelings or situations. And, and a lot of stuff that I write, I don't, I guess I don't think of as body horror because as a woman, you're, you spend your whole life going through various situations just natural situations or cultural situations where you're told that everything about you is horror. You know, everything biological that's happening to you is is some form of horror to someone else. So I I don't I didn't really see it like that. And and I think my protagonist in a way kind of goes through that because I mean it's the end of the 17th century and everything's horrible <laughs> and, and and her life is horrible. And so she can't really understand how what's happening to her is really any worse I mean you see her kind of like oh things will get better things are going to get better I'm going to do this I, I've got a life I've got dreams you know mm -hmm. as as she falls apart <laughs> so yeah I enjoy so, it um sorry Brian go ahead bud oh it's okay um Ellen I love how you jumped in before with a little insight on uh Nathan's story I was wondering if you had anything to add about Livia's no I hadn't I don't remember <laughs> reading it before I mean I must have um. <laughs> you did ask me specifically for that story um and didn't you send me a few though you, you must have sent me a few. Yeah, I've known you, about know, it. you know, I did send you a few. Um, I probably asked you for several, and maybe. But I, but I think I think actually uh, there were uh, there were a couple being reprinted around the same time, and so I want to use something that's being over. Yeah, so you you picked this one because it and also it hadn't been reprinted before, so. Yeah. And Richard, what about you? <laughs> and your story. Uh, my story is a, it's a love story centered around an autopsy and, and it's, very the, short. it's very short and the autopsy is most of the story I wanted. I took some JG Ballard idea of actually using the real life description of a medical procedure and applied horror to it and a love story. Right. What's the title? Uh, huh? Sorry. It's What's called title? Black Neurology, A Love Story. Sorry, I didn't say that earlier. Um, I assume you read Michael Blumlines in the book. Which one of Michael? I can't remember. Issue, ab issue Ablation. Issue Ablation, which I illustrated it was his for, um, oh, you did. for Interzone. Yes. <laughs> which is his first published story, and which That's is right. about, basically about the vivid section of Ronald Reagan. Right. Although I never use his name in it. Right. It's probably for 
you know, libel reasons. <laughs> Legal <laughs> reasons, I'm guessing, because I think he was still alive when I'm So sure then for reasons of the Secret Service not showing up and saying why yeah. you know about this. Michael, Michael was a doctor. I mean, he died. He he was alive when I bought the story, but he had died. He died by the time before it came out. I mean, yeah. know, he died last year. Yeah, we met, we met, uh, I met Michael because of tissue ablation and oh. uh, back in San Francisco many, 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 many years ago. Mm -hmm. Well, he used to come to parties too. I mean, I, yeah. in San Francisco, he was a really nice guy. He was a great guy. Yeah. And a good, a really great writer. Mm hmm. Yeah. I dedicated one of my Sandman Slim novels to him right after he died. Wow. Okay. So, Richard, we we <laughs> mentioned that your uh, your story is is short, but at the same time, it's it's one of those. It might take readers as long to get through as some of the other stories, just because I think I know I found myself, uh, you know, getting to the end of a line and thinking, you know, I couldn't possibly have read what I just read. I got to go back. I got to double check that. <laughs> um, it's filled with let's just say some th there's some imagery in there um so what i want to ask you is uh autopsy love story where where the hell did that come from <laughs> well as i said i mean um ballard was was part of that and i was experimenting at the time with mixing forms and i've been reading a lot about uh, autopsies and vivisection at the time and i don't know why that particular moment, the idea of, of a love story came out of, um, well, this is kind of a bloom line thing to say, the, the sort of intimacy of what, a, what an autopsy is. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are actually going inside a person to see what they're made of. And there's a weird kind of medical scientific um, um, intimacy with that. And I just wanted to take it a couple of steps uh, farther and see where I could go. That's pretty neat. Um, so, Livia, you kind of talked about something that is mentioned in the introduction about women and their intimate, uh, I guess, innate connection to body heart. I'd like to hear from anyone who wants to jump in what you think, I guess, the difference is, is when men write body horror compared to women. Is there anything noticeable that you usually can pinpoint? Who are you asking? I'm not I'm sure. A, I'm sorry, <laughs> it's an open-ended question to whomever wants to jump in. Oh, it hadn't occurred to me. I, the thing is, I'm not all that cognizant of body horror. I mean, this is the first time I actually thought about it with this anthology and bringing these stories together. And I know none of the, the writers, I don't think any of them read the introduction because they haven't gotten the book yet. They may have seen it in the copy edit at some point, I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, I'm actually, I'd be interested to know what you guys think about that because I don't know the answer. I mean, I'm not that knowledgeable about body horror in general. Uh, Olivia, let's start with you. Oh, damn. <laughs> you know, I, I've read so much and I've seen so many TV shows and movies that have, that are just complete body horror or, or have moments that you could classify as body horror. And I, I would say, I don't, I, I don't think there, for some men, and women, there isn't a difference in the type of body horror they write. I think that David Cronenberg has a really good bead on what, what body horror is and what it means for women as opposed to men. If you see a movie like Dead Ringers, you, you, can, you can tell. Um, and actually all of his movies kind of, uh, well, all of them have, have that, um, um, they kind of tackle the issues of body horror and, and I don't think he comes out and quite says what it means, you know, to, to each, to each sex, but he, it, he just presents it. Um, and the audience, I guess, can, can decide, you know, what it is he's trying to say. And that's what I think he's trying to say. Um, 
I don't, I don't read a lot of really extreme horror. So I kind of, I actually, I would say Clive Barker is probably the most extreme that I've read. Um, and it's presented so beautifully. And I feel like for me, it's actually, the difference isn't whether a man writes it or a woman writes it a lot of the times. It's, it's the fact that in a lot of fiction I read by men, a lot of body horror, it's very matter of fact, this is happening. And it's, it's for a maximum gross out and for disgust, which which I totally get, and I'm not I'm not judging it or saying that's an inferior form of writing or an inferior way of looking at horror or body horror. Uh, but the the horror that I read, written by women, the body horror, uh, a lot of times it takes on forms of beauty and transformation and um, putting on this mantle of power, and and going through. Um, kind of an, an evolution and embracing what's happening. And, you know, for me, that's, that's the difference. That's what I look for. And I think that, I think that because women have to live, we live with so much pain and I'm not talking about like, oh, we're crying. I'm talking about actual every month, every fucking month for half a century you know, sometimes severe pain, severe crippling pain, blood, um, you know, and it seems like, like our bodies are, are just kind of created to always be doing things that are offensive to people, to some people, or, or profane to other groups of people. And so you do one of two things, you either you either live with that feeling and you take it in and you say, I'm disgusting and gross. Um, and then you find ways to live with it, you know, Jesus through Jesus or whatever you, you control and regulate your life and like that. And you think that will control and regulate the body horror or you embrace it and you, you, um, you gain power through it or you find ways to express yourself creatively like I do with the fiction. And, and that's what I'm looking for in the fiction. And that's, that's what attracts me. And I, and I think that because, because did someone sneeze? <laughs> no, someone. Oh, I was like, am I being Someone, <laughs> someone either knocked something over in my apartment or next door. And oh, okay. Jack, Jack might've done something. I don't know. All right. Sorry. Not a sneeze. I'll wrap right. this up. So I'm just saying that that just for biological reasons, I think that women tend to look at at pain and and body horror mm -hmm. differently. That we don't quite see it as as horror, and so we write about it differently. Um, Can I so, throw something out? Um, I yeah. just want to throw this out. I'd really like to hear what you all think about that. But I have something that just occurred to me. I saw it. Okay, there are different types of body horror, and one of them is transformation, transformative. Um, but it occurred to me that by writing body horror, men, in possibly the only way they can, experience penetration. I mean, no, not, well, not the only way they can, but, you know, but, okay, let me see if I can get this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I'm thinking of, um, okay, I, I realize with gay men, that's irrelevant, but, but okay, but let's say, okay, straight men, all right, who are writing body horror. Um, could, to me, a lot of body horror is the breach of the integrity of the body, okay? Women experience that all the time, not talking about periods, but just intercourse, all right? Um, so I guess straight men, when they write body horror, are, can, can imagine this. I, do you know what I'm? Do you get what I'm saying? And this is something I just realized. What I was thinking about as you were talking, and I don't know if that makes sense at all, but it just occurred to me. Does anyone? Does it make sense to anyone? <laughs> Ellen, I don't. I don't know if this is where you were going with it, but you know, I kept expecting to hear the word violation out of your mouth. You know, like to me, body horror is so much about trust. You know, it's it's about the the 
meat sack that you carry around with you for your entire life that you're supposed to be able to rely on in some way, shape or form um, betraying you, um, you know, whether it's through some kind of hideous transformation um, or like Livia mentioned, you know, there's the beautiful tra uh, transformation element. But when you were laying out your ideas, I kind of imagined, you know, it's it's a place for uh, men to explore that kind of violation of trust, I suppose. Um, is that at all where you were going or did I just completely no, it's make more something the violation up? of body, of, mm. actual, of the actual body? Yeah. Um, that's where I was going, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I guess what you're saying is that um, women can experience different stages, uh, you know, birth or pregnancy, uh, and even your, your body changes during your period, and then there's intercourse. And so different things are happening to your body and men don't necessarily have all of those things right. happening. And certainly they very, I mean, in trans men aside, um, cisgendered men don't experience that. Right. And, so, and so through body horror, they can explore the, what those sensations are, are what what feelings they lead to etc i think that, so, yes and whether they're whether their characters are male or female i think oh okay yeah yeah um, well, i want i wanted to do a bit of that in my story because there is it's an autopsy you are literally entering uh another body mm -hmm. uh, but i wanted to do it i mean you're, you're entering another body and in what some people might consider a gross way. I mean, a Y incision that opens up the torso. But I wanted to see it in poetic and even romantic terms that there's something inherently, uh, like I said, I used the word intimacy before, that there is something potentially beautiful in any kind of two bodies coming together, um, whether, and in this case, I mean, it doesn't necessarily seem to be consensual, but of course we learn more later. Yeah, um, that, that's a really good point. Karen or Nathan, do either one of you want to jump in with anything? Cause I, I'd like to hear what you guys have to say too. It's very broad, isn't it? It's sort of body <laughs> horror is such an incredibly broad thing. And the thing that I've been thinking about as you guys are talking is that bringing it back to its very, very base level, um, we're, we're frightened of things happening to the body because we should be. That's what keeps us alive. It's, what, it's the reason why we still exist today. We're frightened of having our veins open. We're frightened of bleeding when we shouldn't be bleeding. We're frightened of body fluids that we, sh you know, we shouldn't be eating shit. That's why we think shit stinks, you know. All of these things that actually keep us alive is part of, I think, why body horror gives us a real visceral response um, and why we're disgusted by, by it, and, and that's why it works. Um, that's at its very base level. And I think, to me, it's not... It, I absolutely agree with all the things that you've said, Livia, about um, male and female writing, but I also think there's a... My distinction I often make is, is the people who are writing purely in order to shock and disgust and that's the whole point of it. So they're writing disgusting things in order to make us feel disgusted. And there's those who are examining that, which is kind of what you've been saying to me, Lydia. Um, those who write as an examination and uh, try and understand why we are disgusted and work around that. Um, yes, yeah, so I think it's the, so it's the observer. And, and what that means is that people who are writing just to shock means that we're just observing and being shocked as observers, but the ones who are examining um, means that we're living within that. So we feel more empathy and we feel more within uh, the terrible things that are happening. Which is so the, that's, that's, that's more the distinction that I think I would make, is the ones who are writing to shock means that we're just watching the horror happening and going, oh, that's disgusting. Mm -hmm. And the ones who are writing to examine, which is all of us here and absolutely the people that I enjoy reading more, um, means that we feel more within that horror and we're kind of feeling it from the inside out. Yeah, it's interesting <laughs> listening to everybody talk. It's, there's so many different avenues uh, of approach to this, to this subject. And I think that seems to be, you know, affecting how we 
how we describe it. Um, you know, I uh, when I think of body horror, you know, like like Ellen and I think like Livia said, I don't think when I sit down to read uh, this kind of fiction, I don't think, well, I'm going to read body horror now. Here I am reading body horror. It's like it's like I'm reading a story. And if that's an element of it, then then uh, but I'm not typically examining how that aspect of it works. Um, and when I when I write it, I don't consciously write body horror either. I'm not thinking, here's my body horror story. Um, but, but I, when I write uh, trauma to the body in the stories, it's typically for other reasons. And I think it's interesting hearing this question asked about uh, gender lines because uh, I don't ever think of it that way uh, as a writer. As a writer, I'm. I think. You know, I've been trying to figure this out too, as you folks have been talking. And um, I think of, I, I'm conscious of the kind of like the spiritual horror of 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 the uh, of the distinction between who I am in my in my mind and my soul, and the fact that I'm just I'm just living in a side of beef, which is uh, which is kind of appalling to me on some level. And every time I think about it, it's it's both shocking and appalling. It's like how can I how can I go to the, the, you know, the grocery store and go to the butcher's counter? And, and there's no difference between what I'm seeing on that block and myself. And that's, that's shocking to me, uh, like continually. And, uh, and so when it comes up in my stories, I think, I think it comes up in that context um, or the transformative context. This, the very story in this book um, it's kind of like what Livia was saying with the, you know, the kind of the beauty and transformation. It's like that also is appealing to me. Yeah. The, uh, to me, horror and beauty are the, exactly the same thing. They're both they're two sides of the same coin. And um, it's, 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 the grotesque is beautiful. And body horror is, of course, a, uh, a prime vector into the grotesque. And, uh, and I think, yeah, so I think that's just how I see it, which, which has nothing to do, I don't think, with the gender, at least not, not consciously in any way. Well, that's yeah, interesting. I'm sorry. It's go all, ahead, Ellen. This is very, all very interesting. It makes me realize I don't think I could do an original anthology of body horror because I don't want people writing body horror. You get splatterpunk stories. Huh? You'd get splatterpunk exactly. stories. Exactly. By doing it this way with all reprints, I could pick and choose the stories that have elements of body horror in them, but are not splatter, are not just that. And that's exactly what I intended to not do. I mean, not have a book of splatter. Um, although there are certainly, I, I'm afraid, you know, none of you guys have, have any of you read it? You, you, I don't think you have. Um, you, did you get a copy, Patrick? Oh um, yeah, me and Brennan read it. Yeah. I didn't know you were asking us. So you're the only <laughs> people who have read the actual book, right? Yep. Yep. My edit, my authors have not, <laughs> so I don't <laughs> even know it's in it. Um, but there are some really grisly. There are a few really grotesque, over the top stories. Not many, but there are a couple, and um, that I consider over the top. And they're by P. And I actually, one of them I can think of is by someone who I don't think he ever wrote anything like that before or since. Um, at least I'm not aware of it. But anyway, um, so I mean, I deliberately avoided that, avoided what what people consider body horror. You know, I wasn't, I mean, I was looking for it as part of bigger whole of storytelling, basically. Is and it I'm curious, because some of the way we're talking about body horror is that it is horror and horrible and betrayal, but there's also the aspect of the potentiality of bodies. Mm -hmm. And well, I'm wondering if that's story, part yeah. what you were looking for. Well, some of it, I mean, some of the stories are transformative. Um, there are definitely stories where people transform. I have two fashion stories, one by Genevieve Valentine, which I can, it's a French title. It was published, I published it on um, tour.com a few years ago um, about fashion. I can't remember the title I, and I can never, because it's French and I never remember it anyway, sorry. And then there's another <laughs> one by Christopher Fowler called The Look that I think I took for the year's best, but I don't know where it was originally published. And both of those are fashion stories about fashion 
and the, the lengths people will do to be fashionable and to be, to be beautiful in some, in some way, per, perceived as beauty, beautiful. And it's pretty grotesque, both of those stories. Um, I'm trying to think of, I mean, I, a lot of the stories are transformative are about transformations Ellen, from one thing to another. Ellen, I, I just had a weird question pop in my head about the model. And now we always try to, we try to make ourselves while we're alive, beautiful. Have you ever gotten a story or have any of you read a story where someone's trying to make the dead look beautiful? You mean that's the point of the story or that's just part of the story? Whether you know what? To... I don't know. It just popped up well, to my head so much. That's sure. what morticians do all the time. Oh, you yeah. Know? Okay, fair enough. Yeah. And Richard pretty much, I know he's the closest in this anthology to that specific no, question. No, 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 no. I don't no. think so. <laughs> and autopsy <laughs> is not the same thing as putting, you know, doing a mortician's thing. You know what? Who, who invited kind of me opposite. to this conversation? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> terrible, terrible comment, Patrick. Uh, Brennan, go ahead, buddy. Take over. <laughs> I actually want to cycle back to something uh, Nathan said a few minutes ago. He, you know, was talking about the the whole, I guess, realization of walking up to the butcher's window in a in a supermarket and realizing that that's there's just not as much of a difference as as we kind of put on it. You know, we certainly as humans have this sense of self importance, but I think uh, a big part of uh, one aspect, because, you know, part of the, a huge thing of this conversation is just how many different ways body horror can go, how many elements and aspects it can follow. But one way it can definitely go is just that, you know, come to dust moment where we realize that despite our sentience and despite our, you know, lording over this planet, um, at the end of the day, we are just sides of beef. Um, and I love the way it's so, so elegantly put. So, you know, I, I, some of you guys have answered this already, but I'm curious if anybody else has anything to put in as far as um, when a story it has body horror elements, what is it do you think that appeals to people? Because uh, this is a subgenre of horror that people seem to be really digging right now. What do you, what else besides what we've talked about do you think appeals to people? The mm -hmm. idea of transgression. transgression how well certain acts are transgressive um a lot of body horror is transgressive you're going you're doing things that are not right <laughs> that are not normal i mean not all body horror but some body horror you know you're you're going over the line and watching regular people go over the line reading about them i don't know maybe it thrills Readers, what do you guys think? I suspect it's it's similar to what people respond to uh, with horror fiction generally, which is you know in the broadest possible way to put it, it's just fascination with death. You know, it's memento mori, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and uh, and seeing this you know this the the, you know, the transgression of the bound, body's boundaries, uh, which is kind of what body horror is. You know, one way or another, uh, it's 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 a kind of uh, it's a kind of looking the beast in the eye, and uh, acknowledging it, and uh, and uh, you know I think people draw different things from that, uh, whether it's some sense of catharsis or some sense of peace or some sense some, some sense of defeating it temporarily. Uh, it could be different things, but uh, but I think it all kind of circles around that that central that central idea of you know reckoning with your own extinction. But I think there's other ways of, of defining the word um, going beyond death and the idea of transgression, because one person's transgression can be another person's beauty. Um, I'm kind of covered in tattoos at this point. My family, there are parts of my family that basically think I'm the devil for that. Um, you are. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and that's a transgression for a lot of people for all from, you know, most what I consider rational people at this point, it's mm -hmm. nothing, but it's an exploration. Um, I think this kind of horror is an exploration of what you can do with your body, 
another body and to just experience uh, new ways of, new ways of thinking about bodies what are, what are the limits and potentials of the human body so you get into piercing extreme forms of piercing um, again considered transgressive by some people uh, beautiful by others but all extremely intimate and all extremely deep into the body itself. Uh, I don't know if I'm explaining this quite right, but I, I'm trying to say that there's that beauty and transgression are basically the same thing. It's just a point of view. Mm -hmm. Scarification, I think it's called, is another one. Yeah, I have, I have, I have a couple of scars. Um, Where? I remember when you were doing that and you decided you didn't like it. <laughs> Well, I mean, then it, it, became, a, it became a fad, mm -hmm. you know, um, all kinds of um, blood sports and things like that. Well, blood sports, that was kind of big in the 90s and certain, kink, you know, parts of the kink world mm -hmm. um, were really considered to be the limits of human, mm -hmm. uh, of, of what people were doing to each other and, or themselves. And yeah, I, I was part of that for a while. And then again, like all things, it becomes just a fad like anything else and it became boring and but there was nothing about it that made me go oh this is evil or wrong or we should just all stop doing this mm -hmm. it just became you know um what all the cool kids were doing and then at then that point no i don't want to play anymore well i guess to, i guess to start with we said it must have been um exciting because it was transgressive and uh in theory, dangerous and that sort of thing, do you think? Is that one of the things that makes it exciting to do or interesting to do? Oh, yeah. I mean, again, I have a tattoo that's right there. It's about, I mean, it, it, it's it's the characters for, for danger and beauty, mm -hmm. which I kind of consider, again, two sides of the same coin. You have to go, you have to push yourself. You have to go beyond certain limits to find... Um, I'm sorry, I'm petting my cat at the same time I'm doing it. <laughs> um, Nathan was too, I could tell, I think. Were you petting yeah. cat? Yeah. Mine are um, mine. Mine's making trouble, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> but you have to, yeah, I, th I think life and body is just one big experiment. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes the experiment turns out great. Sometimes the experiment is just a big mess. And that's part of the process. Okay. I wonder if some of that body horror stuff is about uh, looking danger in the eye, but we're not really, I suppose, like we're doing it from a very safe place. Well, you know, writing, writing dangerous stuff, but right. not actually putting ourselves in danger. So, But well, still, I mean, the brain is such an amazing thing that when you're in the middle of something like that, you are actually living it to a certain extent, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But reading it is also a substitute for doing it. Mm. I mean, yeah, and if you can sink into it enough, then it is a, a good substitute. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of shows that cover different plastic surgeries too. Um, <clears throat> and I know some people that are very hardcore into watching reruns every episode. So there's definitely an attraction too, because we're talking about fiction, but there's an attraction to uh, watching real um, uh, talk about oh, anything from very much overweight to people mm. with things on their body that aren't very natural, uh, abnormal appendages, if you will, um, to making yourself quote unquote beautiful. And, mm. you know, this shows on tattoos, on piercings, on everything. So yeah, it's basically like we're a canvas. Mm. <coughs> but also there's something, very nice. something very Cronenberg about the fact that this is now a TV fad. Mm. Yeah, it was, it's been a while though. I remember all the didn't they have those plastic surgery things in nine in the nineties or the aughts? The show it was it was an extreme plastic. I don't remember what it was called. Mm. So never watch it, but I, I think know. there was a show in like either two thousand or before that about people getting major plastic surgery, wasn't there? There was one called The Swan. I don't know if that's the one you think you're. Yeah. I think was the one. I, wasn't that the most? I think I still think that is the most horrifying thing that's ever been on television. I don't know anything about that one, but what it's just like the other ones. In, was that yeah, a, a group. Of, I don't know if it was all women or not, but it was a group so. of people. Um, they all had massive plastic surgeries 
they went from average looking, they wanted to be beautiful, they wanted to be swans. So then once they were beautiful and they were finished, then of course they would find love and happiness and fortune and whatever. But they had to go through these excruciating plastic surgeries and uh, it's just, uh, Oh. <laughs> was this a reality show? I, I couldn't yeah, watch it. was it. a reality show. Yeah, yeah, it was. I think, it people was. Did get, I think people left each week or something like yeah, that. I, I can't was, actually remember. Oh. It was a contest at the end contest. of each, each week. You know, people were voted off for not being beautiful enough or having enough wow. surgery. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it was like, it was like a really... It was but a it shitty like, version of Gattaca. <laughs> yeah, it sounds, yeah, it sounds like half a reality show because the first half of the reality show would be the swan where you get tons <laughs> of plastic surgery and transformed. And then the second half of the show would be a year or two later. What's happened to your body? What's happened to your <laughs> life? Because yeah. of this surgical... Yeah, they know, probably um, didn't do become... that because everyone was like insane and in debt and uh, <coughs> utterly disappointed with their lives. <coughs> what is that? And the fact that the ones who get thrown off early, remember, remember, are Jo- jo- remember Jocelyn Wilderberg? I think her name was Wildenstein. Oh, the cat she, lady. Oh. I saw her in person once, or someone like her. I wasn't she sure the, it was actually her. She's the Barbie some- lady. Not Barbie, she looked like she's a, the cat lady. Oh, the cat lady. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I, I can't, I'm not absolutely sure it was her, but I'm pretty sure it was her. And she was just walking down the street in my neighborhood, my old neighborhood, and looking in shop windows and kind of admiring herself. I'm like, oh my God, is that her? Wow. <laughs> I mean, if it wasn't her, it was someone like her. You know, it was, it's really um, scary mm. <laughs> it's like what people will do. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, I wonder if there's going to come a point in time when uh, that's kind of the next thing of really where this, I'm not trying to sound like I'm making a joke of it, but where they're a class of citizens where I don't even know what the name would be, um, humans that look like animals or whatever, because I've seen a few of those and there's a lot (laughs) of interest, at least online for that. Well, I I read an article like, just not too long ago about more and more people are, are are really starting to experiment with a lot of surgery like that getting I mean you know Holly Black had her ears pointed but but people <laughs> doing like really really transgressive surgery getting their tongue split and experimenting mm-hmm. with having tails added to the base of their spine um there's it there's a convenient there's a um a, a having having horns oh i've seen people with, oh yeah yeah that's now, been going on for 10 20 years yeah there but people, yeah. but i mean usually yes but they're one-offs they're not your normal person on the street yeah yeah but but <coughs> it's i mean this is really really extreme surgery so it's not it's not like tattoos where 20 years from now everyone's going to have a split tongue but but it seems like more and more doctors are saying yes we can do this and yes i'm going to do that to you and you don't need to go to some dude who's operating out of a goth nightclub you can actually make an appointment and your insurance may be able to cover some of it and you know it's not just the vampire teeth it's the horns and the i don't think cosmetic surgery is covered by insurance (laughs) well i mean we want to talk about tattoos people are getting the whites of their eyes tattooed so their yeah. eyes are completely yeah. Oh my God. Back. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or, or yeah, getting different shapes <laughs> so that you, they look how like. How does someone do that? Fat you know, how, eyes how, how, how do you literally? How do you do it? I don't know because it's one of those. I mean, I don't. I don't get squicked out by a lot of stuff. But um, yeah, that one did. As yeah. a tattooed person, the idea of having gone through having needles scrape oh, my God. skin, oh. the idea of scraping my eyeballs is not. Oh, uh, I, I don't know. If it's, I, don't, I don't know if it's done with needles. I don't know if it's done some other kind of process. Yeah. But you, but there are people out there turning their eyes completely black. I, I gotta imagine that's a risk of going blind from that surgery. And my yep. question for all of this is, what's the emotional and mental toll it takes on people with those <laughs> extreme surgeries? Well, also physical toll. You know, mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, the after effects. I don't think people are going to know for a while, depending mm. on what kind of drugs they've been <coughs> they have to inject to make the changes <clears throat> do you have to keep up with it every decade or so I, I'm not well, i would sure. think some people do horns, i think wow. would think once you have horns they stay horns yeah 
but there are people i mean go to go to las vegas any any club in las vegas you're gonna see people who've gone through five plastic surgeries on their face like every they get older and every couple of years they're gonna go back and get something tightened to the point where they, oh they just God. they just look <clears throat> absurd yeah no it's a shame a lot of unfortunately a lot of actresses feel they must or did feel that yeah and, you can tell, and it usually you can tell, and it's really horrendous. I mean, they're unrecognizable, and it's not oh, a good thing. Botox can do that. I mean, Botox is literally poison that is, and it's used sometimes for medical purposes <laughs> for people with certain kinds of jaw conditions that gets, the, when the jaw gets locked, um, Botox can help unlock that by um, mm -hmm. going after cer certain nerves. Yeah. But, you know, there are p people obsessed with getting Botox because they're afraid of crow's feet. But at a certain point, it's just, it's just going to kill off your face. It's just going to kill off the nerves and the muscle connections. And you're going to have this deadpan face. You will not smile for the rest of your life. Yeah, I've um, seen it. Yeah, yeah me too. I'm really quite relieving not to have to smile ever again. Yeah, that's horrible. <laughs> or smile all the time like Mr. Sardonicus. <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. there you go. That's funny, huh? Smile forever. Yeah. So Brennan, jump in, buddy. I've been asking him questions recently. Oh. <laughs> I don't right. know how to follow that. <laughs> no, no. I, I mean, I, it, 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 there's, there's a lot of ways we could go down the, you know, people with that horns cool. route, but I'm not, I'm not entirely sure that's uh, <laughs> where we well, want to go. I'd rather read about it than do it. There yeah. we go. So <laughs> get your stories in, people. Um, <laughs> Ellen, when we had you on for your solo episode uh, earlier this year, mm -hmm. um, one thing that we talked about was curating the order of an anthology. And you know, you had you had some nice insight, but I I, I thought it'd be interesting to ask that again with a specific anthology in mind. So you know, once you had your stories picked here, your reprints, um, how did you go about deciding the order for this one? <coughs> Well, what I do, what I always do with any anthology is the first story is most important and the last story, I think, especially the first in a way. And what I want to do for a first story is make, try to get it to be accessible, not too weird, not too complicated, and we'll draw the reader in and kind of give a feel for what the anthology is about. And that's what I did with the first story, Traveler's Rest. Um, it wasn't too, it wasn't too offensive or anything and it wasn't too provocative and it wasn't too as it, it was not complex it was just you know it was it was straightforward and that's important and i mean i don't remember what the last story is hang on <laughs> you know? oh tissue ablation right okay there you go <clears throat> yeah right and um, that to me um it's not the strongest story i mean it, it, whatever you mean by strongest story it's a strong story that is like in your face kind of um, and everything in the middle, generally, you try to make sure that the tone's different, that the word, you, you've juggled the word length. You don't want stories, all this, you don't want like five really long stories or three or five really short stories. You try to vary the length and the vary the point of view, vary where they take place. You know, you're just trying to juggle that all. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes you realize, uh oh, those two stories are, have similarities. I have to move them around, <clears throat> which is what happened with my monster anthology that's coming out next year. As I was, I, I had announced the table of contents and the order. This one's called Screams from the Dark. And um, I suddenly realized after I had already posted what, if, you know, the order, when I, I guess I can't remember what I was doing, why I happened to look them over again. Maybe I was. But for whatever reason, I looked over the stories again, I realized that two stories had similar endings, even though the stories were very different. <clears throat> so I needed to move one of them, and I did. So you try to give a good variety. I mean, I, it's like some people say, oh, what a great order. You know, it's like, well, sometimes, it, you know, in a way, it's like 52 card pickup. You know, I try to do it, but it doesn't always work, you know, and um, it's and if you have um the thing is if you have a really weird story <clears throat> you want to put it in the maybe a third of the way through or two thirds of the way because that way you get the people already hooked and they 
can see everything and say, oh, these are blah, 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 blah. I was like, oh, that's weird. But they're already hooked in. So <laughs> now I know why my story is always that third of the way. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, that's not, you know, they can handle it right now. But of course, you have to realize that you can't, as an editor, I can't guarantee anyone's going to read stories in order. Yeah, but I'm, I'm that it. person. I, I have to ignore that and <clears throat> just assume they are, or at least they're going to start with the first. <laughs> you know, there's no other way to do it. Ray Cluley uh, is the first one. That was a pretty neat story. Uh, I'll leave it at that. I was going to talk more about it, but I'm going to spoil it. So um, we would like to jump to, unless anyone has anything else to say about this, um, we'd like to jump to a kind of a breakdown section where we talk about each of you individually. Uh, where people can follow you, final thoughts, and any last words you want to say on the anthology. Um, before we do that, though, is there <clears throat> anything you guys want to talk about that we were just covering? Karen, were you going to mention about how I saw that story? Did you submit that story to me once? Yeah, and so, well, it, it kind of, it's a little bit of a spoiler, but that's okay. I think it's not too much of a spoiler. Go, go so for I it. started off, I started off talking about me circling the Revenge Anthology oh, right. um, and Get a Dress. And I did actually write the story for Ellen and she didn't take it, but it's this <laughs> story. I worked on it, like she rejected it. She had some really nice thoughts. She really encouraged me. She told me not to put paper clips in. This is in the old days where you had to mail stuff off. Um, so I'm mailing from Australia to America, having to go and get these reply pay and envelopes. And oh, those stuff. IRCs. Ugh. Yes, awful. Such a pain. <laughs> but, yeah, I paper clipped it. She sent me back saying no paper clips. <laughs> no paper clips. Um, but worked on this story, reworked it, reworked it, sold it, it won an Aurealis Award. And then years later when, I, when Ellen came to Australia for a visit, I mentioned this and she said, show me that story. And she really liked it. She said, I'd buy it now, you know, now that you've rewritten it. Two weeks. And that is the story that's in this anthology. So it's the first story I sent to Ellen, reworked, rewritten, and sent. Well, see, that's what's and aggravating. I hate when I turn down stories and people totally rewrite them without showing them to me. <laughs> I mean, if it's a complete revision, you know, I mean, sometimes I say, I, if I don't say send it to me, if you revise it, then I guess I, it fair is fair. But, um, you know, but it's annoying. Like um, Pat Murphy had sent me Rachel and Love, Richard, I, mm -hmm. and I turned it down. I mean, I had Romney and I had, you know, I gave her feedback on it. Apparently she took the feedback and then sold it elsewhere. I feel like, <laughs> then it didn't open the board, so. Yeah, I forget, which, I forget like, what that ended up, but yeah. <laughs> I think Asimov's and it's like, well, why didn't you send it back to me, you know? <laughs> yes. Well, I would not have dared to send it back to you at that stage. I was too too terrified of you. <laughs> <laughs> and that that anthology became Lethal Kisses, unfortunately, because the the publisher Anthony Cheatham decided that would sell better than what I wanted to call it, which was some vengeance vengeances or whatever. But it was is a revenge and vengeance anthology with the title that's Lethal Kisses. That sounds mm. so. <laughs> Uh, it was follow up to Little Deaths, which was an erotic uh, mm. sexual horror anthology. Hmm. Uh, that's an interesting tidbit. So, um, I'll start with Richard for this one. Richard, where can people follow you? Uh, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. I'm just Richard underscore Cadre on Twitter. I'm pretty active there. A bit less so on Facebook these days. I have a website, richardcadre.com. Um, I'm on Instagram, R Cadre, and that's kind of about it these days. Um, I just can't handle anything much more than that. I don't have a newsletter. I don't have any of that stuff. It's but just... mention that you have your new, your last book out, the last of the Sandman Slim. Oh yeah, I have um, book twelve of the Sandman <laughs> Slim series, uh, King Bullet, and that wraps up, you know, over a ten year process of wow. telling this. Uh, dark fantasies some people consider it horror series about a man who is who escapes from hell comes back to earth for revenge and ends up finding that he actually kind of likes people uh, he comes back with the intent of basically destroying everything and then ends up saving the world i guess it's better times. more than once multiple times <laughs> uh i'm also I've just finished the first volume uh of a series we're doing with Nightfire towards Horrorline 
uh, Cassandra Kaw and I are writing a horror series for that. The first book is called The Dead Take the A-Train. And that's pretty gory. But it's also funny. When's it coming out? When's that one coming out? Next September, I believe. Make sure I get an arc. Yeah, we're we're, we're still doing the rewrites. But... um, well, I would think you'd get one. I mean, it's it is. Well, Nightfire is my publisher now. As one would think, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> maybe. Make sure she's on the list. On the on the list, sir. Please. Yeah. <laughs> uh, do you have any final thoughts? Anything you want to say about this anthology, or anything at all? Uh, I'm I'm very happy to be. I'm I'm happy to be in any of Ellen's anthologies. Uh, I'm still thrilled to be, and. Ellen author from time to time, so that really makes me happy. And this book, this. <clears throat> I haven't read this book, but I'm really looking forward to um, everyone else's story from hearing everyone else's description. I'm really excited by it. Excellent. Uh, Karen? Yes, I'm also happy to be an Ellen also, and an Ellen friend. Um, so yeah, I've got, I've got a story upcoming in the Monsters Antho, which I'm really excited about. Um, so Cemetery Dance Novella at some stage, I'm hoping, sooner rather than later. Um, which is a very weird story about a giant man made no, of no spoilers. Oh no, it's not a spoiler. That's at the beginning. A big giant Iron Man where you, all the dead bodies go in and what what comes out his toe. That's what oh. that novel is about. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's all sorts of cool stuff happening in there. Oh, and tools tale, tool tales in your other novel in your novels. Oh yes, yes, Ellen and I have got tool tales, which is really cool. I don't know if you've, you've seen that one. It actually started on Facebook where Ellen. Put up, oh, it's so cool. So you know, Ellen has amazing collections of things, including weird tools. Mm-hmm. And she said, "Oh, she said to me a few years ago, oh, no one's going to be interested in seeing all these weird tools.'" And I said, "Well, how about you show me the tool, and I'll write a weird little story about it, and we'll put that up, and people seem to like it." And so we got a little book published of them. So I think it's ten weird tools and I wasn't allowed to try and figure out what the tools were I just had to write something about them so I wrote 10 nasty stories about her very interesting tools and then people came in and told us what the tools were about or had some theories about them didn't they? some of them I had no idea what they were so we showed you know, I said what are these yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyone know what this thing is were you close yeah. with any of them oh yeah no well well, yeah, close-ish, I think. Close-ish. Yeah. Close-ish. Yeah. I kind of, in a way, tried not to. Like, I, I kind of, if I had an idea, I kind of tried not to really guess what they were because that defended the purpose of me writing a weird, nasty story about them. But, yeah, <laughs> I've, got a, I've got a collection of my own nasty tools, so I should write some more stories based on my own, I think. But, yeah, that was a, really, that's a, that was a very cool collaboration. It was a bringing together of the minds, I think, Ellen, was very fun yeah we had time and then we got through 10 and we decided that was it we didn't have yeah but tell about your other work coming out and where we can reach you sorry it's like I don't know. oh that's all right no all just all just all the social medias twitter karen warren and facebook and i've got an instagram but i barely use it so i really i am i just don't i'm really not interested in people's photos at all so i don't <laughs> tend to go on instagram which is a terrible confession to make but i'm just not interested in people's <laughs> photos that's fair um yeah and then i've got quite a few short stories coming out um just because things have been delayed for so long um but yeah quite a few bits and pieces including i oh, Maybe you're in the sisterhood one, aren't you? I think. Oh, that one's been going on for years. <laughs> Forever. Oh, oh, it, it, oh it, that's supposed to be coming out soon. It Wait. went on so long, I ended up selling the story to to um t- to Nightmare Magazine like Gosh. three years ago, and so oh. I, so he bought it as a reprint. He was like, "You don't get money for it." And oh. I was like. <laughs> fine i didn't know the book was ever going to come out it's so. been so but it's such a cool book like i stuck it with is. it because it's so it's such an interesting concept and such a cool book Wait, which book is that sisterhood sisterhood yeah. it's called isn't it yeah so female yeah right, right. Chaos. basically yeah i finally i got on epub and moby <clears throat> i haven't got a print book yet Mm. No one, no, it no does one. not exist yet. Yeah. <laughs> That'll be another three years. Yeah, I'm sure, That's Ellen good. is on the list. Yes. No, I actually got the ebook. I mean, I got the ebook already. I hate reading ebooks of stories. I was like, oh, I'd rather read print if I can. I used to be like that too, but then my wife said, "Pat, you gotta stop getting so many goddamn books because <laughs> she's not a reader like us." So. 
yeah that's where they come in handy sometimes um karen is there anything else i don't want to jump to the next person it's just been great great seeing you all and hearing words of wisdom and inspiration so thank you (laughs) uh nathan um i'm gonna echo what the other two have said uh i'm on uh twitter instagram uh just look up bowling root and 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 you'll find me there aren't many of us out there um uh facebook although i've all but abandoned that lately and i have a website nathanballinger.com um and uh and i haven't read the antho this anthology yet but i can't wait to um like the others have said i'm thrilled to be uh selling stories to alan datlow again alan has has uh i've sold most of the things that i've written uh most of the short fiction i've written to her and uh I feel like, uh, like she's been my partner in this uh, in this career that I have. In many part ways. of my stable. <laughs> I'm thrilled, thrilled that's the case. Uh, upcoming uh, later this month, uh, there will be a uh, a podcast. They're calling it an audio movie uh, called Treat. I think that 25th is getting released on platforms, uh, all the usual platforms apparently. Uh, I've got a novel uh, coming out from Saga Press, probably not until early 2023 at this point, um, mm. but you know, it's it's there. Uh, What's the title? The Strange. What's it about? It's a dark fantasy. It's about, uh, it's, it takes place on Mars in 1930. Um, mm. uh, mm. It, uh, the, uh, uh, the elevator pitch for that, and I hate to even use that phrase, but it was pretty good, <laughs> the Martian Chronicles. Uh, and there's definitely oh. a lot of a lot of the DNA of both of those in, in this book. Then it goes off into its own strange direction. Um, but it's gonna be different than I've, what I've had out before. Uh, and so I'm both nervous and kind of excited for it to arrive. That sounds really, really cool, actually. Um, excellent, uh, Olivia. Well, um, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram. I left Facebook five years ago and have never felt better. <laughs> <laughs> it just didn't do anything for me. And I have a website, which I have not updated in six years. So it looks <laughs> like I'm dead. So go, go to Twitter. <laughs> and um I'm thrilled that I'm coming out in a number of Ellen anthologies. So, you know, including um, this one, uh, the monster one next year. Um, And I've got some other uh, short fiction coming out as well from other places. And um, I'm a very slow writer. People know that. Um, And I am working on a novella right now, and then I don't know what I'll do next because it just takes me so long to get anything done. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> Everyone writes at their own pace, you know? Yeah. Um, Ellen, how about you? Where do people follow you? I'm on Twitter and I'm on Facebook. <clears throat> I might be on Instagram, but I don't even look at it. So. You are, but you <laughs> never you, you never post anything. That's why no. I haven't friended you. <laughs> oh, <I'm sorry. laughs> Once in a while someone will post something on Twitter and it goes to Instagram. So I'll go there and like it, but that's the only reason I go to Instagram. I don't have time. I mean how many social media things can you do? <laughs> anyway, and I have a website that is not updated much. At least I managed to get Matt Kressel, my friend who's a writer who's an IT person, to at least put up my current books, you know. But that's it. I mean, it's outdated too. I mean, I just, oh, I have a blog on it that I sometimes do say things, announce something on. I don't, you know, mostly I use Facebook and Twitter. And you just said that Shirley Jackson anthology. Oh, yeah. When release. Things Get Dark, which I have here. I've only I finally got my copy today. I'm really happy. You got it? Oh, good. I have to check that everyone's gotten it. That's such a cool cover. I've seen mm-hmm. a lot of good you things get, about that. You see it backwards too, right? Do you see it backwards? Nope. No. no. That's good to us. Because I see it backwards. <laughs> it's like, oh, okay. So I'm glad that it comes out the right way. And oh, we got to look at this. This is great. 
what they did. Look at this. I love that. Interior. Gorgeous. I didn't know about With it. Glasses. With glasses. Yeah. Right? Nice. And, 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 hold on. You guys have not been on my Facebook page. And look. Oh, oh that's nice. great. <laughs> it did a gorgeous job. So, yes, that just came out last week. And I'm really pleased. Um, <clears throat> and I also have my year's bet, my best horror of the year number 13 is coming out in November. Oh, wow. Uh, Ellen, you know what? We've all, everyone here that works with you um, pretty much says the same thing that I see from other authors that work with you. They, they just, they're, I, I'm putting words in their mouth, flabbergasted, gra grateful, um, and feel honored. So I'm going to ask for those that don't have the opportunity that listen to this, how can someone get on your radar besides walking up to you and handing you a manuscript? <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Don't, don't do that. Don't do that. Great stories and I'll see them for the year's best. You know, while I'm reading, I try to cover as much as I can that I'm aware of in the horror field. <clears throat> and um, so I'm always, and there are always more anthologies coming out of, positively and negatively. <laughs> There's a lot. Um, yeah. So yeah. I mean, the more every year, and, um, you know, once I see those stories, if, you know, I notice people writing them and I, I always have a section at the front or I have in the last five years or so saying which authors I'm publishing for the first time in any book on any form, you know, that I've never, and then authors who I've never heard of. And you know, I'm really pleased to say there is always, there's usually at least one or two writers I've never heard of who are in my year's best. So that mean you know that's to me that's good. It means I'm I'm aware of other voices who I have that I've not been aware of before. So that's basically how you get on my radar. Okay, so there. Okay, so there's no submission. Just write good stories. <laughs> write good write stories. Good. Yeah, yeah, and I'll see them probably. And okay. solid yeah. life advice, honestly. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Brennan, you any final thoughts or anything? Final thoughts. I want to thank everybody for uh, spending your Saturday night with us, uh, except for Karen, who is spending her Saturday morning <laughs> slash afternoon. Sunday. 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 Yeah, the, the, the future thing. That's right. Um, oh, Karen, oh, email me so we can make a date. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, thank you guys for your time. Thank you. It's thank I'm you. Just, I'm just going to echo Brennan. I really appreciate this, guys. This is an excellent anthology. I mean, Brennan, I've read it and uh, enjoyed it and it's to to bring this all the way back to the very beginning i don't think that people should expect what they normally would in a body horror meaning that there's um not to knock any previous body horrors they may have read but it's different and it's it's got a lot of heart to it so um thank you guys for writing those stories and uh thank you for the arc ellen so we could read that and for your time on the saturday slash sunday morning uh, we appreciate it, and um, we'd love to have all of you back at some point. So thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah. And listeners, thank you. next episode, episode 120 is with Claire L. Smith, um, another Australian author. That airs next Monday. You have many choices in podcasts. Thank you for picking us.